All right, guys, so we got a special presentation today by my buddy, Adam Price. Adam uh, has been working with Jason and I for many years now um, as our financial advisor. He's helped us set up, you know, multiple retirement accounts, life insurance, a bunch of different things. And uh, I really wanted to have him on today to, you know, talk to you guys a bit about just, um, you know, putting your money to work for you and thinking about our future. You know, we spend so much time think, you know, talking about how to close more deals and how to earn more commissions. So what happens after you earn those commissions, right? What are we doing with our money to have it continue to work for us? Um, so that's really what the topic's gonna be all about. So Adam, um, I don't know if you have a presentation you do or if you wanna even just get into just kind of some fundamentals and basics and then maybe talk a little bit about how you help certain clients and maybe what these guys should be uh, looking for as they start to, you know, accumulate more income and, and close more deals, you know, how should they be thinking about their money? Definitely. Definitely. Well, well, good morning guys. Um, you know, this uh, presentation that Enrique and I have been talking about for a while, he's uh, you know, he, he cares about his field force, you know, and he wants to make sure that, uh, you know, not only you guys are making money, but you're saving it because it's what you, keep is not what you make uh that's going to help you uh in the future and unfortunately there's no loan for retirement so you know you have to save on that so i do have a presentation enrique this morning that i wanted to share visuals a lot better than you know just me talking at people and so forth but um i'm with a firm called pfs investments in primerica uh you know we focus mainly on middle income folks and we show them exactly what they need to do to retire well get their kids to college, own homes, things like that. And so, um, but, you know, the, the biggest thing is why people, you know, don't invest their money is because they either don't instant, understand the market or think that the market is riskier than other things. And so I'm kind of here to kind of debunk that a little bit and kind of give you, uh, you know, what uh, what it is and, and why you want to, to invest. And then um, I will go into it. Well, let me just start the presentation. You can We'll go over that agenda real quick here. Oh, got to share screen first. Can I, do I have a uh, capability to share screen there, Enrique? Uh, you should be able to. Can you guys hear Adam okay? Are you guys going to all hear? The volume sounds good? Okay, cool. Okay. There you go. Perfect. Here we go. All right, so let's see here. Perfect. Let's see if I can get this to start. There it is. Okay, so everyone can see the bull and the bear. Yes. I can see you guys. I'm, I'm just seeing my screen. So this yeah, is interactive. So if you guys can speak, I want to make sure you guys can see the screen. It. Awesome. Thank you. So, you know, you guys might, might even heard of that, you know, uh, out there. It's like, OK, it's a bull market. It's a bear market. Um, but sometimes people don't explain what that means. You know, uh, in a bull market, that means things are rallying. You know, the the, the economy is picking up, the, the, the market's up. And in a bear, it's either you know, slowing down or declining. So it's like, oh, it's a bear market, it's a bull market. That's why in our industry, we tend to use those two symbols. Um, I have to put this up since we're recording today. Here's some legalese here for you guys. Again, I'm talking about investments, we're, you know, very compliant. Uh, and so uh, our agenda today is, you know, why to invest, you know, how markets work, successful investing, what to invest in, Types of investments, and then I'll leave some time for some Q and A. Uh, maybe some things that uh, you've always wanted to ask. Okay, so um, bull markets are born in pessimism, grow on skepticism, mature on optimism, and die on euphoria. When I first heard that, I'm like, "What the heck does that mean?" Uh, and that was by Templeton, who uh, you know, uh, John Templeton, who actually you know, it's Templeton uh, Investments now. Um, but it, it's relating to this this uh, this graph here. So we as advisors, I mean, I don't manage the money. I don't have the time, temperament, expertise to do that. Wake up every four o'clock in the morning, start trading on the market. What I do is I manage client behavior and what people naturally feel. And so this is the math, you know, the market emotion. So when the economy is doing great and markets are optimistic about it, uh, you know, they get excited, they're thrilled as the market continues to bull. And at the height of the market, it's like, oh man, I can do no wrong. Things are awesome. You know, my investments are growing. But then as it starts to turn, and you know, sometimes anxiety kicks in. It's like, okay, well, okay, a little bit of turn is good, but I hope it just keep going down. 
then you know you're in denial like okay it's, it's going to come back up you know it, it's going to come back up pretty soon then you get into fear uh, of desperation did i make the right decision you know um because up here man I, I, you know i'm the smartest person in the world when it's here when i'm here you're like oh did i make a good decision then you know uh panic and capitulation kicks in it's like oh you know just forget it you know nobody can win at this thing and then yeah again that you know how, how could i have been so wrong and then when it comes back up it goes back to that cycle again but it's right here at that point of the of maximum financial opportunity is right here and this is where you've heard people say oh i'm losing money or i lost money or oh, the market you know it's always negative and and it, I'm here to try to tell you that that's actually the opportune time. You know, because we all have heard of you buy low and you sell high. But most people, when it comes to the market, that just goes out the door. And they're like, oh, I got to get some of that Google. I got to get some of that Amazon or Tesla or whatever the case is. Because, yeah, it's splitting and it's doing all that. But that's the time that you've kind of missed the boat. But throughout the years, the average stock market rate of return has stayed at about 11%, double-digit rate of returns, which, you know, for – a long period of time, and if you look at the legal ease, this is from 1921 to 2020, it's done that. And there's no other market that outperforms that, including real estate. A lot of people think, you know, because we're in California or whatever, real estate is one of the best investments you can. And it is. It should be definitely part of your portfolio, but it's never outbeat the stock market. There's only one investment or investment type that outperforms the market. And that's fine. Fine art. Can you hear me? Yeah, Adam, really quick. The the sound keeps going in and out. I don't um I don't know if it's going in and out for you guys, but for me it keeps cutting in and out. I don't know if um are you just speaking into the laptop or do you have maybe a earphone or a headset or anything that can or uh, well, microphone I, or anything that can plug in? Because it keeps going in and out. Okay. Well the the only thing is that the headset I have is even worse. Um the <laughs> mic. My, I have a mic attached to my laptop here. I mean, my uh, monitor. Um, I could just try to stay a little closer to yeah, you. Yeah, maybe you hear me good now. Closer. I think because when what happens is as you're moving around, like it's uh, it's going in and out, in and out. So I don't know if okay, if there's a way to get it closer to you or something. No, no worries. I'm I'll, I'll I'll try not to move so much, and I'll talk more into the mic. If you can, so can you hear me clearly now? Yeah, I can hear you. It's just a little low, so I don't know. You may have to. Speak speak up a little bit more or something it's just okay. it's not a problem also could be also be good uh, could be my internet can be a little too so I don't X quality okay so uh, so with that you make most of your money in the bear market you don't just but you just don't realize at that time you know going back to the slide it's and I tell all the clients I sit down it's just on the decline is when you create wealth and on the incline is when you realize it and that's what that statement is also saying, is that on the down is where things uh, are created and on the up is when they're realized. Just right now, we all know if gas dropped to a buck 50 a gallon, we all be out there at that, that gas pump, you know, filling extra gallons in because we know it's going to go back up. Same with the market. So here it shows, you know, history is one of our greatest teachers when it comes to that. If you look at this, uh, this graph here, it shows the next five years following the last seven bear markets. So. Uh, right after in these years there were bear markets but just what happened to the market right after now we all kind of understand what happened in 2008 and 9 so i'm gonna use that because you know some folks weren't alive back in the you know so but uh yeah the one year return on the market was 49 percent after it dropped like something around more than 35 percent and it went up one year the five year after that's 161 percent and it averaged 21 percent each year in that five-year time period so again, just because things go go down, a lot of people step back when they actually should be charging. And that, that's exactly what uh, one of the greatest investors of our time and who talks about when people are cautious, he's aggressive. When people are aggressive, he's cautious. You know, and that, again, that, that uh, was Warren Buffett. Okay. So what do you think is going to happen in the next five years? Now, we're in a down market now. What do you think is going to happen in the next five years? Are things going to go continue to go down, down, down? History's never seen that, or is it going to go back up? You know, and how far is it going to go back up? And are you participating in that? Okay, so we talk about fundamentals, like like Enrique said. Uh, we talk about the three D's of investing. One is dollar cost averaging, the other one is discipline, and the third is diversification. Now, dollar cost averaging is just a fancy word of saying 
Invest all the time. Make sure that you're investing consistently all the time because you never know because nobody has a crystal ball. I don't care how good they are uh, as an investor. They just don't know what's going to happen. So if you're not investing all the time, you might miss some of those key price drops that actually helps you to build wealth. You know, so you're picking up more units when it goes down versus when it goes up. And the discipline is just to stay that course, you know, is not to change your investments around every, you know, three months or pull in and pull out and things like that. Again, that's where I, I come in and people feel in that way. We kind of talk about it and, and I let them know, hey, you, you want to stay the course because X, Y, and Z. Okay. And then the third is diversification. And we kind of all heard of that. You don't know, put your eggs in one basket. But in, in this case, diversification is don't put your eggs all in one sector of the market. Again, if I were to give you a couple hundred thousand and say, hey, go buy five cars, you know, go buy five vehicles, you probably wouldn't follow five, buy five trucks. You'd probably buy a luxury vehicle, maybe a sports car, a truck, you know, something, a people mover. You'd buy different type of vehicles for this application. Same thing should happen in your portfolio. You know, everything shouldn't be all. In, in one sector, even though the sector is attractive and like, man, it's doing really well. Well, in certain times it won't. And therefore we want to diversify to make sure that we're capturing all sectors. Okay. So bad news is an investor's best friend sometimes. You know, it lets you buy a slice of a, the American future at a market down price. And I tell people, you never want to bet against the American economy. The reason being, everybody in the world banks here. We have more U.S. dollars outside of U.S. than we have in it. And if there goes the U.S., is kind of there goes the globe, you know, because everybody has an invested um, interest in what the American market does. Okay, So I'm going to go over two slides right here. And these are probably the most two important slides that I, I really want you guys to grasp and understand. Because if you understand this, you, then you're going to know more than 95% of the people out there when it comes to investing. Now, we go to that systematic investing. Again, that first D of diversification, uh, of dollar cost averaging. And it's a proven method. We've been doing it for gosh, almost 40 years now and showing that it works. So as far, as far as most people are, you know, we have investor A, investor B. And as far as what you know about investing, okay, uh, what example would you prefer? You know, if you're investing over a six month period and you started at $10 a share, you want that $10 to then double to 20 in six months? Or would you say, yeah, I'm okay with it going, you know, dropping down all the way to $2 and it's just coming back to where it started. Most people would say, you know, I'm actually rather double my money and watch it go from 10 to 20. That, that's, you know, what, what I would prefer to do. Well, we'll see if that's actually the best thing to do. Because here you have investor A and B both investing $100 for a six-month period. Now, investor A started at $10 a share. So he bought 10 shares at $10. By the time he got done six months, they're at 20 bucks a share. But because the pricing, the rise, uh, rising cost of the shares went up, he bought less and less shares. So he ended up with 42 shares at $20. Now, so can someone real quick grab a calculator and do this math for me? 42 times $20 and tell me what that is. Eight forty. Eight forty. Okay, perfect. All right. So now, investor B, same thing. Started at ten dollars a share, ten bucks a share first month. Now his shares went down, so he was picking up more shares throughout that time. So okay, eight forty at forty two shares. So by the time six months comes in, he just got back to where he started, but now he has one hundred and twenty six shares. Okay. So I mean, we all can do the mental math on that. One twenty six times ten is about twelve sixty. Correct. So here, if you look at on the bottom, that the same $600 was spent, different share share quantities, but the average share cost for A was $14 and some change. Average share cost for, for B was a little under five bucks, $4.76. So not only did he pay less for shares, he has more shares of it. And so we have 840 versus 1260. So again, that the name of the game is share accumulation while you're trying to create wealth. OK, and this, and this, this is taking another level. So here, let's say this 20 goes to 21. It made a dollar. It went to twenty one dollars a share. And then this ten dollars went to eleven dollars a share. Well, for that twenty one, he made forty two dollars on an extra dollar increase. But B made one hundred and twenty six dollars because of that share cost. 
And that's the difference of trying to time the market or, you know, timing the market. We're just saying it's time in the market. He kept that 10 bucks, uh, that hundred dollars going in every month, no matter what was going on. Okay. Because he knows that, Hey, at the end of it, it really doesn't matter what the share value is today, unless you need the money today. Okay. So that right there, if you were to apply that, then you know more than 95% of most of the people out there. Because right here, they'll, you'll hear everybody, oh, I'm losing money. I lost money. And they pull out and liquidate where they wouldn't stay that course because they don't understand the, the, that, that dollar cost averaging you know, um, rule. Okay? So now also, too, is that you don't invest with your head. I mean, you invest with your head, not the headlines, because there's always going to be some reason to, uh, you know, to sell news, sell news time, sell newspapers. Uh, e even, you know, you know, people in our industry, you know, like to sell doom and gloom. And if you look at some of these times in a period, uh, most of us have been aligned during this time period, you know, are cognate during this time period, you know, uh, knowing what's going on. But like, for instance, uh, some of you may or may not realize what happened in 1999. We had a Y2K scare. We thought that because we've never been at a millennium point with computers that the computers weren't going to understand the click over of the clock and everything was going to shut down. And it was, it was pretty crazy and kind of silly at the time, but nothing happened. Uh, but that next following year, 2000 kind of reflected that. So there was a tech tech stock fall that people were freaked out about. And then the following year we had September 11th with the terrorism tax in New York. So we have negatives here that happened throughout that market. And the volume here did reflect it. And we had the financial crisis back in 2008-9. Okay, but if you look at, even though all these negative things happened throughout the time period, the market still bolstered 10.69% rate of return, still double-digit rate of return. So you see how over time you can achieve your investment goals regardless of what's going on in, in, in the world because everything is cyclical, okay? So a lot of people say, oh, you know, I'm risky. It's, it's not a good time. All of that is just kind of out the door. And so that was numbers. Here's visually. So here, way back, and I'm, I may not be able to see it because it's a little small, but let, let's just go back to, to 2001, okay? We've seen that there was a decline, and then, of course, a tragedy happened. Uh, and then 2002 went down, came crawling back up, and then also we had the 2000 you know, financial crisis. Bam, you see that big drop there, 30-some percent. And then we would take we'd been on a, a slow increase until we had some type of you know natural disaster happen. That kind of blipped, and here we are now. Now this is 2020. It blipped up a little bit, and we're about right here in the whole scheme of things. So if you started investing back in 2010, we're way beyond where we were in 2010, even though crap happens. And I tell people it doesn't matter what's going on in the market as long as you're consistent in what you're doing. And as long as you're consistent and making sure that wealth is going to be there for you and your family on the long term. Okay. So that's, you know, just two ways visually and numbers wise, how things looked out. Now, when it comes to diversification, make sure when all eggs aren't one basket, the market looks like a quilt. As you can see, you know, each color here, just like a quilt. And, and it's usually derived of, you know, micro sub accounts, but these, these accounts are usually international stocks, small stocks, large stocks, 30-day T-bills, which is a government-backed uh, uh, entity, and also long-term government bonds. So as you can see, there's not always one on the top or one on the bottom all the time. So if you're within all of those, you're always going to participate. So if you look at the small stocks, lot, nice little heartbeat that you see there. It's up and down, up and down, creating wealth, realizing it, creating wealth, realizing it. And you look at international stocks, same thing, up and down, nice little heartbeat. So again, even though it's up one year and it, and it falls short in the other, this is when you're creating that wealth and then you see it. Okay? And then you have large stocks don't move as fast, not as volatile. Those, those blue chip stocks that kick out dividends and such, <laughs> those don't fluctuate as much, but you're participating because you have that consistency there. And then government bonds. All those, those go up and down, tied sometimes to treasury uh, T-bills and, and interest rates and such. And then you have 30-day T-bills, those short things. Again, as you see, the, the rates of return aren't huge, but when the markets drop, a lot of money goes into these areas you know, to preserve it. Okay? So again, making sure that you're diversified within each one of these categories, no matter what's up or down, 
you're always participating. You're not trying to time the market or a certain sector. And that's where we come in as advisors to advise you in that. Uh, and if there's anything major happen, then yeah, you know, we'll reach out to you, maybe do some slight adjustments, but it's never anything gradual. Um, I mean, that's uh, drastic. Now, all of those markets can be attained through mutual funds. And some of you guys may be familiar with mutual funds and some of you may not. And so I always go over basics of what a mutual fund is so that we're always talking at the same level, okay? And we feel that this is one of the best investment vehicles for long-term investing that anyone can do, no matter what your income bracket is. And so what mutual funds is that individual investors like yourselves and myself, we pull our money together. And then we invest with a professional money manager. Now they manage, manage the money. I don't, like I was telling you before. And they make sure, because they know everything that they need to know about these companies. Trust me, they look at all their their uh, their profits and loss and potential lawsuits. I mean, they even know, you know if the CEO is getting married or divorced or what's going on with them, you know, what can affect a decision. So you would have companies, and, and these are companies you recognize, like Verizon, McDonald's, and Walt Disney, and Microsoft. So in each one of these mutual funds, you can have a, upwards of 150 stocks. So again, you're hundred dollars going in just doesn't buy Procter and Gamble or just doesn't buy Pfizer. It buys a, a portion of each of these companies and you own a, a, a portion of each of the companies. And the likelihood of say something happening in the uh, telecommunications market with Verizon is most likely not going to affect what happens in the pharmaceuticals. Or if something happens in the consumer with Procter & Gamble, you know, it's not going to affect McDonald's. So again, you might have some companies that drop and some companies that increase. And through that balance, you get an overall, you know, rate of return that you can compound year after year after year. Okay? And that's what those fund managers do. And yes, there's a small fee for service. You pay for them to manage that. Uh, but again, it's something that you don't have to, to worry about because they're doing that for you on your behalf. Okay. Adam, uh, yes, sir. real quick, does, does anybody have any questions so far? I know this is a lot of info, and for some of you guys, it, it may be, some of it may be familiar. Some of you guys, it just may, this may be a whole new world you're stepping into. So I encourage you guys to ask questions. I'm looking at the chat. Please type your questions in the chat yeah. if you have any questions about what he's talking about so far, um, so that we can make sure that uh, we give you the most value today. Definitely appreciate that, Enrique. Yeah. I just didn't want to uh, kind of make this one of those, you know, uh, <laughs> Bueller type presentations where, you know, I'm putting you guys to sleep. But what really what's going to make a difference when you because when you're in conversations with people, you hear these things. And now I just want you to know, wait, wait, that's what he was talking about. You know, you only lose money if you sell and things like that. So here and this is something that uh, that most people don't understand when it comes to mutual funds and 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 stocks and so forth is that. The stock market is the only investment that you make money three ways. Okay. You make money first. Of the, I'm going to start backwards. Capital appreciation. Of course, the stock going up, stock going down, that affects that price. So most people say, okay, you know, I bought it at 10, I'm at 15, I'm doing good. But also, there's two other ways. One's called capital gains, which you guys might be familiar with being in real estate. When somebody sells a house and they, it's more value when they bought it than there's a cap gain they pay taxes on. Same thing in investments. There's a cap gain that is kicked out or distributed to the fund family and those fund managers, but they they do that so they can profit share with their with their stockholders or shareholders. So you get a portion of that capital gain. Okay. And then the third one is the dividend. Okay. A dividend is the same thing. It's profit sharing where they decide I need a tax break. The uh, the fund needs a tax break, so they'll kick out a dividend. They get the tax break. You guys get to share in profits. So that's three different ways that 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 money uh, is made. And so right now, even though markets are down, the capital appreciation portion of it is not really working because you know, hey, it's, it's uh, most most portfolios are down about twelve percent right now. But what's funny is that a lot of those portfolios that are still down, they're still getting kicked capital gains and dividends. So money is still being created, even though the, the portfolio is down. Now, that doesn't happen in any other style investment. You know, if the house is down on real estate, it's down. You know, I mean, yeah, you might be getting, you know, rental income from it or something like that. Uh, you know, but you still got property taxes and upkeep and all that with it. But here, it, it's not that way. So, again, just because markets are down doesn't mean you're not making money. And that's 
the huge thing about investments that you can do that, you know. Um, and and again, they're also the stuff they are some are subject to taxation, some aren't, depending on the vehicle. And we're going to go into those as well, what type of investment types that there are. Okay. So five great reasons why to own mutual funds versus an individual stock. Okay. First, we have professional money management. There's not there's no money management there with an individual stock. It's just your entry point and good luck on that. Okay. You diversify your assets. Again, you can have Apple and 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 Verizon and and uh, you know Amazon and all that in a mutual fund. You don't have to necessarily own it individually and be subject to whatever that volatility is, but you can still participate in that owning. And when it splits there, it also affects that mutual fund. Okay. Uh, growth potential. Again, you have a greater growth potential with your money being diversified and professionally managed in a fund. Uh, affordability. You know, uh, it's it's easier to to be able to say I can afford you know two hundred dollars a month or five hundred dollars a month into a mutual fund versus okay entry point you know to, to really do anything you have to buy a thousand shares of you know a, a certain stock and it, whatever that cost is and then subject to whatever the volatility is. Okay. So, and then also liquidity, you know, it's sometimes very rare, but sometimes, you know, when you want to pull out of, of a stock, depending on what's going on with that company, you may not be able to sell. You might have to wait for a certain period, you know, but within a mutual fund by law, they have to have a check cut to you within seven days is what happens. So anyone that has a mutual fund that you're, is held in for you, they have to do that. It's not like, okay, well, we can't sell right now or, or that it's doing too bad or anything like that. It doesn't matter. Check needs to be cut, and that's a, a FINRA law. Okay. Uh, again, now, most mutual funds aren't guaranteed against loss because you know, I guess they are in the market, um, but they also have costs and fees associated with those as well. And when you sit down with your advisor, you can uh, go over the, what those and make sure they're appropriate for you and your risk tolerance. Okay? Now, tax deferred versus not. I mean, it's like, okay, well, why don't I just invest? Why do I need an IRA or something like that? Uh, because individual retirement accounts offer tax deferred savings, meaning that you're not going to be taxed on it year after year after year as the money grows, okay? So here, if you invested $10,000, uh, you know, uh, per year for 30 years at 9% rate of return, in a tax-deferred account, it would reach $1.5 million. In a, just a, a brokerage account, a non-tax-deferred account, because of the taxation, it only reaches $739,000, or a little under $740,000. So it's a big difference on where you put that money, um, not just how you put the money and how often you put it, but where it's sitting. And that's, again, also something that your advisor helps you to, to select and so forth. So what I'm going to go over here is different types of areas you can save your money, especially for retirement or education savings, okay? And you might have heard of some of these, and maybe some of you haven't. So if you have any questions on these, please feel free to ask. So the first one you've all heard of probably is an IRA, and most of it is traditional IRA, meaning that you contribute, uh, contribute to it, and you get a tax deduction for it. Now, anybody under 50 could put $66,000 into that IRA annually. Okay, and it's tax deferred. If you're over 50, it's seven. Then you have a Roth IRA that's not tax deferred. It's actually tax free, free as long as you know you, you pull out of it at the right time, which is 55 and a half. So it, it is a tax free investment. So that's great that you can save hundreds and maybe millions of dollars into a, a tax free investment, meaning that when you pull from it, Uncle Sam doesn't ask for anything, you know, which is a nice thing to have. Again, $6,000 contribution limit there. Then you have a SEP IRA, which a lot of you guys would probably take advantage of. That's a self-employed plan where you can take a portion of your self-employed income, your 1099 income, and put it to this plan. You could put up to 25% or $61,000. You know, that immediately comes off of your income. That's huge. One of the best plans that you can have if you're self-employed. And then you might be familiar with these other plans, a 401k plan that's usually employer sponsored, 20,000, 500 you can put into that. And a simple, which is very similar, um, but has you know a few, few less uh, bells and whistles on it, you can put up to 14,000 into that. And then if you're over 50, it's 27,000 into that 401k if you're over 50 years old. Now, a lot of people don't understand, uh, are unaware that there's actually individual 401ks as well. So let's say you are self-employed. You don't work for an employer, but you know what? You like all those benefits that a 401k provides. You can open up your own 401k, still subject to the same contribution limits. Now, there's some cost with it, but a lot of people like those the, the, the extra intangibles that you get with a 401k. 
And then the rest is this, a regular brokerage account. Again, and it's an investment account that's not tax free. It's, it's not tax deferred. You get taxed on the growth each year. Uh, they send you a, a 1099, a miscellaneous 1099, and you file that with your taxes. Okay? And then you have education savings. So those that either are wanting to go back to school for themselves or are planning for, you know, uh, for children's education or something like that. You have a 529, which is really popular. You can put up to $16,000 a year into that. And then a Carbondale which is not as popular, has a lot more freedom than a 529, and you put up to $2,000 per participant, okay, into those type of plans. Uh, again, those these these education savings are for higher learning majority, but the Coverdale you can use for private school or um, certain camps, you know, put through the, the school and things like that. So you use it more than just higher learning. So we tend to open up a lot, a lot of those as well, okay? So those are majority. Now there's a few other things, co plans, all that, but that's all getting really, you know, we're diving deep into the weeds there. But this is majority of what is going to be available to you and that you would want to utilize. Okay. Now, uh, again, the firm I work for is Primerica. Uh, PF Investments is, is our investment section, and we are a one-stop financial shop. Like Enrique said, you know, we've been, gosh, I think it's, I want to say, about 11 years now, um, that uh, we do the entire cycle of your financial. Uh, you know, health. We not only we we help with debt. Uh, we help with uh, you know down payments on mortgages, uh, retirement investments, uh, regarding to education and, and annuities. Uh, we also do uh, a lot of things with having to do with your identity theft uh, and so forth. So there's there's a quite a bit of what we do there. Um, so if you're needing you know something more than just investments, then most likely we, we can help as well. The only thing we really don't do is like checkings and savings accounts. Okay. So here's my information. Uh, you guys definitely record it down. That's my cell phone number. Uh, very rarely will you actually get an advisor's cell phone number. Uh, I welcome calls seven days a week. I take appointments all the way up to 8.30, sometimes 9 o'clock. You know, this is uh, my company, my book of business. And so, uh, you know, I, I like to hear from my clients and, and know what's going on with them and their family. And so I can best help them to do that. Uh, so right now, this is going to be the, the, the best time to do some Q&A. Uh, if you need to go back to a slide or something like that, um, you know, this, this is the time to definitely do that, if, especially if you had a question that you've been dying to ask and you just don't know who who to best uh, answer that. Um, Adam, go ahead, go ahead and un, maybe unshare the screen. Sure. And then... Um... There you go. Hey, Blanca. So guys, those of you guys watching, Hi, Adam. Uh, yeah, Adam's been working with Jason and I. I think he's, he's worked with Blanc. He's worked with a few people on our team. And the reason I brought him on is, uh, like I said in the beginning, is as you guys start to make more commissions and stuff like that, you got to start thinking about what are you going to do with your money, right? We got to start thinking about what's our future going to look like. Are we saving up for retirement? Are we taking advantage of these different investment options? And you know, putting our money to work for us, right? We work so hard to make our money. Now we got to put our money to work for us in the long run. Um, so it starts off with things like this, right? Just educating yourself on what's out there. Um, and then from there, the, the best thing to do is, is to set up a time to, to maybe talk to Adam individually on your own circumstance, because it's going to look different for every single person, right? Every single person is going to have a different situation, different income levels. Maybe you got income from a spouse, maybe you have kids. So there's different things to consider in the equation. Um, but the bottom line guys is, is I think one of the mistakes I made early on in my career is I was too focused on just making money and I wasn't focused on saving money and really putting away money for the long term. And it wasn't until many, many years later into my career that I started taking this part of it seriously and started actually setting up retirement accounts and started accumulating wealth and, and putting money away, you know, for, for later. Um, if I can go back and do it again, I would have, I would have met Adam a long time ago and educated myself on this stuff and started from day one. Um, right. So it's, it's, it's one of those things where right Adam, I mean, investing is, is something where it's, it's the time that you put into it, right. It's not, it's not a get rich overnight. It's just like buying real estate, right? It's like if you would have bought a long time ago, you'd, you'd be very wealthy today. So 
it's something where you start sooner and then over time it's, it's going to accumulate. But Adam, um, I guess for just in general, for these guys that are they're mostly independent contractors, self-employed, making commissions on a 1099, what do you see like at the very minimum they should be doing with their money? What are, what are the key things that they should be putting their money into? Well, you know, like you said, everybody's different. But a general rule I tell people to do is that if you got low overhead, you know, you might want to you know look at putting about 20 percent of your income. So 20 cents on the dollar or 20 dollars of every hundred dollars you make should go into your financial future, which and that doesn't mean you have to invest all of it, but maybe some of it that you should have what we call three fundamental accounts. You have an emergency fund so that you're not pulling from credit cards or payday loans or borrowing from friends or family to pay for those up unforeseen things that come on. And then you should have like a midterm account. Uh, that's where you're going to use the money within the next three to five years. And, and that might be for down payments on a home or a vehicle or vacation or quinceanera, whatever it is. Uh, and you're using that buying power to do that. Because when you can come with cash, you can negotiate that. You'll, you'll get a better deal than financing things. And then the long term. The third one is our long term, uh, our, our wealth building account. And the reason we have the first two set up is because when it hits the fan, and you have some cash to pull from, great. But if it's bigger than that, then at least you have that midterm you can pull from. So you leave your retirement account to do what it's supposed to do, which is grow and compound. And yet you're not borrowing from your future or using that from your future. Because when we sit down with people, most of the time, out of those three accounts I just mentioned, they have the retirement set up because, oh, it's at my work and my job kind of forced me to do it. And, and that's why it's there. But if that's the only place you're saving money, then that's the only place you're going to go to pull from it. And therefore, there goes your future. And like I said, there's no loan for retirement. We have to do that on our own. And unfortunately, our government's not like other governments where they forced, uh, you know, to do that. It's something that we do on our own. Uh, so like, again, if you have lower head, 20 percent of your income, maybe we got some debt. Maybe we'll, you know, do somewhere around 10 or 15. But then we put a plan together to get you out of debt as soon as possible, because that is like the biggest catalyst towards not being able to retire well is debt. Okay, and so uh, in order to eliminate that, imagine all the debt, your your car payments, your credit card, your mortgage payment, all that was now invested on a monthly basis versus going out. That is early retirement, you know. And if you can, you know, even help your clients say, hey, you know what, you know, we can even attach you to an advisor because you help them to acquire it, or you help them to acquire a mortgage, and then now we can show them how to get out of it a little quicker. Maybe we we show them how to double down on a payment, saves them ten years, right? Now, 10 years of mortgage payments go into an investment that now is for their, their future and they retire a little earlier, things like that. So we look at the entire you know, portfolio and we actually write plans to that. Now, we don't charge for our time or advice and you'll never do that. You just pay for the services that you are taking advantage of. You know, uh, We just feel that with middle income folks, they're not going to spend $300 to $3,000 for a financial plan. So we just put that together for them. And they follow that plan and we meet with them at least on an annual basis to make sure that we're on track. And uh, we tell them, hey, if anything in the market that you need to know about, we'll help you and we'll show you what we need to change. But same thing, if life events happen, reach out to us. You have people now. And so, you know, that's what the wealthy do. They, they all they have lawyers, they have accountants, they have advisors all to advise them in different areas. Well, that's what we do for our clients as well, you know. Yeah, I, th I think one of the things that, that stood out for me many years ago was the concept of paying yourself first. You know, we make money, right? We get a check, we put it in the bank account, and then what we normally immediately do is start paying bills, start paying our credit card, our mortgage, our car payment, our rent, whatever it is we got to do. We start paying everybody else first, and then if there's anything left over at the end, then we're like, all right, I'll put this in my savings account. Right. And that's like the complete backwards mindset, right? Like your landlord or your mortgage company or your, your, whoever holds your car loan, like they don't give a crap if you retire or not. They don't give a crap if you're building your wealth. They don't give a crap if, if when you're, you know, 55, 60 years old, if you have any money to show for. Right. So a big concept was pay yourself first. Right. And when you're able to set these things up, on like an automatic payment where it just comes out of your account and that's the first thing that you pay, you're essentially making yourself and your future a priority. So that, that was like something that just kind of blew my mind and it stuck with me ever since was I got to pay myself first before I pay anybody else. 
And, and it's really boils down to a strategy, right? Sitting down and looking at your income and, and doing some calculations and saying, hey, this is more or less what I bring in every month. This is how much I can pay myself every month first before I pay anybody else. And when you do that, you kind of like just set it and forget it. And, you know, I've opened up retirement accounts and IRAs like years and years ago that I've just been on auto pay. They're on auto pay. I treat it like a bill, but it's really a bill to myself. That's what it is, right? It's a payment mm -hmm. to myself and it just comes out and I set it and forget it, forgot about it. I check it maybe every, you know, twice, a couple times a year, you know, when it's tax time or whatever. And I'm like, man, I didn't even realize I have all this money stacking in there. And it's just been growing with, with the market, you know? Um, and then the other thing, Adam, I wanted to touch on right now that the market's down, I wanted to reiterate the power of, of dollar cost averaging because a lot of us through EXP, which is our, our parent company, we have the stock option where we can allocate 5% of our commission and we get the stock at a 10% discount. Um, so that's a feature that EXP gives us for being part of EXP. You can buy their stock at a discount. Now, like the, the whole stock market's been going down. So their stock has been going down as well. And there's some agents on our team who were initially participating in that who now saw the stock going down and they're like, oh, I'm not going to buy no more stock. It's going down, you know? And you just talked about dollar cost averaging. So I want you to maybe touch on that, like whether they should be participating in that stock thing or not. Like I know the answer, but I want you to maybe reiterate, reiterate that. Right. Well, first of all, then just to, to back up a little bit about what you say. So this is a visual that I always talk to people about because a lot of people have debt here and their assets are here. And they're like, well, I'm going to wait till this happens until I can say, okay, now I have money to start investing. But it's not the dollar amount, it's the time. So maybe it's just you 10 years to do this. And then finally, that's 10 years in the market you lost. So I was like, well, why don't we just do this? Just take a portion of your, your money and we do this in that same 10 year period. So now that you haven't lost that time, because a lot of people take, pull out of their 401k and say, hey, Adam, don't worry, I'm going to put it back. I'm, I'm, I took 10 grand. But I'm gonna put I'm gonna put it back. I was like, it's not the money. I can't recreate the in and outs of the market that you got over time and the amount of shares that you accumulate over time. That I can't recreate for you. So you still are losing. So that's why I tell people, you know, let's look at something and do something on that because time is the enemy. Now going to what Enrique was saying about investing in down markets. Yeah, that's the natural thing to do is pull back. You don't want to lose your money, as the as the said is. But he said two things. One, systematic. You don't have to think about it. It just happens out of your commission. So you don't miss it. Your commission is there. You, you don't have to think about putting it there. That's great. The other one, you already have a 10% equity. If you get to buy the stock at 10% lower than what it is at what they call NAV, open market, then you already got yourself an equity position. So even if it drops, you're still winning. And when it's dropping, it's you're, you're purchasing more shares, like I showed you in that illustration. But then when it comes back up, you, you're then winning with a 10 percent equity. You know, and that's the cool thing about, you know, when you have uh, employee stock purchase programs at work and, and, and uh, a program you guys have is that, again, it is kind of like out of sight, out of mind. You know, you still get your check. And that's why investing through work helps because, hey, this is my check and I get used to that. And. 10% of it went out and I don't even miss it after a while because I adjusted my lifestyle to it. Same thing here. If you can do that, uh, even if, again, you don't think it's the greatest stock or whatever, but you're, you're getting a 10% equity in that, then that to me, I, we can't give you free money. And that's kind of like the best thing next to it of getting free money, you know, when you do sell eventually, you know, again, if it's in real estate, then it's cyclical. It's going to go up, it's going to go down, but uh, you know, you just have to know, what amount of money and when do you want to do that? And that's the biggest thing. When I sit down with people, they go, oh, hey, I just want to invest and make my money grow. I go, okay, um, but what is it growing for? I don't know. I just want to grow. <laughs> I go, okay, well, money without a goal never achieves it. So I don't know how aggressive or conservative we need to be if you don't have a goal attached to the money you're saving. Like, hey, this is for my new down home, my payment on my home. This is for my dream car. This is for my kids' college plan. This is for my wife's new anniversary ring. Whatever the case is, and you put a timeline to it, and you put a dollar amount to it, then we need to know. Okay, well, it needs to be that amount of dollars and this many, this much of time. Okay, we have a plan we can put together to do that. 
you know, and you can gauge it and quantify it and, and track it and things like that. So that's another, you know, key point is to make sure that you have goals and that you, you know, work fast so that you can achieve those if they're monetarily, that is, you know, and it, and uh, I 100% back what uh, Enrique said about paying yourself first. Um, you know, it's almost biblical. You know, the Babel, you know, back in Babylonian times, they were the poorest people, but they bought themselves out of slavery by saving anything they possibly could. And they were able to do that. And I always looked at every dollar you earn is yours before anybody else's. And it's like those dollars are are working towards and fighting for your financial independence, your financial future. But if you give those dollars away, you have nothing to fight that good fight with because your bills are always going to be there. And they're always going to get paid because they have to. But like he said, nobody's forcing you to save because it's not any interest of theirs to do that. So that's where you come in and you save for you and your family. And then you're, you know, and then when you do that, the interest you're making out, that, that means you always have money to pay your bills if your money compounds and you have it in the future. Not only to pay your bills, but, you know, to, to give your lifestyle uh, a, a, a fighting chance. Okay. Yeah, and, and I think the worst thing that you want to happen, guys, and 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 I'm speaking from experience, is is you make a bunch of money because if 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 you commit to this, you know, industry in real estate and you you do well, you're gonna make money. You're gonna make good money, right? You're gonna make more money than you've probably ever made in any other career. But the worst thing you want to happen is you wanna look back and you're like, man, I made a bunch of money and I spent it all. That's all I did was spend it all. Like, yeah, I went on vacations, I went on trips, I got a car, I got this stuff, but I got nothing to show for for a rainy day. If shit were to hit the fan today, there's nothing there, right? Because I'm so like over leveraged or tapped out and I've spent it all, right? Like you, you want to be smart and say, hey, I'm going to take a little piece off the top and I'm going to put this away. I'm going to put this away. I'm going to put this away, right? Some, and that, that's where it's just being smart and just understanding that that's the game, the long-term game. And then you like, like Adam said, after a while, you get used to putting that little piece away and then you adjust your life around that, right? You already know, like this, this percentage is going to me, everything else. That's what I got to work with for my bills and my spending and, and whatever I'm trying to do. So you don't, you don't make the same mistake that, that I've made early on was like, there's a bunch of years wasted where I, I just, I blew a bunch of money, you know, to be honest, you know, and, and there wasn't much to show for after that. Um, that's why I'm right. and actually guys there. too the tell you thing is i've showed some people that guy got my, my budget so tight man i just you know i can't do it and i'm like well what do you and i just look at what are they paying in taxes and they have no tax deductions whatsoever or if they do they don't add up to a lot and so i was like look if you were to put let's say i'm just giving a number out 150 bucks away a month and that is deducted from the taxation you're able to put that away for free and you still get the same amount on your check because of the deductions that now you can do through an investment. You're like, wait, I, I was able to put 150 bucks and I still get the same check. I was like, yeah, because of that deferred you know, uh, taxation, because of the deduction that you get. So sometimes it's just little things like that that make a huge difference in the long run. Uh, and again, you're not uh, taking anything else away from, from yourself, uh, just knowing that and having that little basic knowledge. Now, again, in your guys' position, a set buyer, you know, if you're if you're bringing in one hundred and fifty thousand and you could put sixty one thousand dollars away and not be taxed on that. I mean, that's jumping so many tax brackets down. I mean, you're literally you're probably paying something like, you know, eight to nine, maybe 10 percent in taxes. You know, if you're going from that to 70 grand or something, that's just that's huge. But you financed it. I mean, you're not financed, but you invested towards your future. And that's 61 now is, you know, 10 years from now. You know, it could be over 300 grand, you know, and again, you saved yourself on taxes. So there's always a better way to skin a cat. Uh, again, if we have that knowledge and applied knowledge. So Yeah. Adam, what's the, um, for maybe some people who are just getting started, maybe they don't have a ton of money to put away, right? Mm -hmm. um, what's the minimum amount you can invest into a retirement account? With our firm, it's yeah. $25 a month. Any 25 firm, bucks yeah. a month. Yeah, 25 bucks a month, whatever you want to say, five bucks a week, whatever you want to say, but it's $25 minimum into uh, one mutual fund is what you can do now. Of course, you're not going to get very far keeping at that, but it's to us, it's more of getting the habit started. You have you saving on a monthly basis, seeing that money go out, and then you see a statement come in, 
your name's attached to it and there's assets growing on it. It's just, there's something about that, man. It just get, turns people on and they're like, okay, okay. I think I could do, I could, I could do a hundred now. Yeah. But they want to see that money grow, but uh, you know, just to get there. And that's where we, we meet people where they're at. You know, a lot of other yeah. firms will come, they go, well, you know what? Uh, when you can put at least a thousand to 10,000 starting in a thousand months, we can talk to get, you know, advice. If you go to the web, you know, web, you can, you know, you can open up things. Uh, I think, yeah, minimum is about usually about a thousand and then, you know, you can subsequent, you know, 250 or whatever the case is. But our entry point is at um, 25 bucks a month. And if you don't have a lot of money, that means that probably your income is not over 169,000 a year. So therefore you would qualify for a Roth. So that's what I would say. Open up a Roth with, you know, as much as you possibly can. That's that $6,000 a year you contribute because that money is then going to grow tax free for you. Because after you make over 169,000, then you don't qualify for one anymore. So it's it's an income thing with that. I mean, and that's it. If you can have, imagine hundreds of thousands of dollars you can access without being taxed on it, and it grows and grows, and you're still not, that's 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 a beautiful thing. Yep. So let's um, guys, that's powerful because I think a lot of times we think I got to have a bunch of money to start, right? And it's it, it just it, like he said, it's building the habit of investing. So even if it's twenty five bucks a month, I mean, I know for a fact. 99% of the people out there can scrape together a couple hundred bucks a month, right? Like if they stop going to Starbucks here and there, or they stopped doing this or that, right? Like you can scrape together a hundred bucks a month or 200 bucks a month to invest in your future. Um, so it, it's, it's one of those things where if you see the importance of it, then you'll figure it out and you'll make some priority. But if money's tight, you know, and at the bare minimum, 25 bucks a month, is pretty, it's, I'm pretty sure, you know, 99% of the people out there can, can do something like that. So, um, guys, uh, we're coming up on time right now. Uh, I want to thank Adam for, for showing up guys. Let's give Adam a little, a little hand for showing up today and blessing us with some knowledge. Um, yeah, remember guys, guys for this, listening. Was just the, this was just the intro, right? This was the introduction right here. This is to get the wheels turning, get the mind working to understand some of the fundamental concepts reach out to Adam. I'll put his name in our Slack channel, reach out to him, no obligation, pick his brain, tell him about your personal scenario. He'll talk to you. He'll meet with you. We'll figure out a way. And at the very, very least, you'll know exactly what you need to do. Right. And then from there, it's just a matter if you want to move forward on some sort of plan. Um, you know, so use it guys. It's a resource, right? Use Adam. And I know he'll, he'll take care of you. I wouldn't bring anybody in to our office that I didn't think would take care of you guys. So, uh, definitely has my, my backing and, and, and support. That's much appreciated. Enrique. Trust me and feelings mutual. All right, y'all. Thank you so much. Hope you guys got some value today. We'll see you next time. Let me know if you need anything. Thank you, Adam. Thank you guys. Enjoy the rest of your week. Bye-bye now.